This is Samantha Scott. Um, she's a hospitality management major. Um, she's an excellent student. Her presentation today is from the travel and tourism class. And in that class, they have to plan uh, trips to an, a US destination and an international destination. And this trip she did for her US destination. She did it so well, I wanted to like book a trip. I never wanted to go to Portland, Oregon before, but after I saw hers, it was so detailed and she did everything that we asked and her, um, you'll see when you um, look at it, how well it presented it is. So I wanna congratulate how well she's doing in the class. Thank you. All right, I guess I'll get started then. <laughs> Share my screen. Um, all right, can everyone see it? Sounds good. All right, so I'm Samantha and this is my trip to Portland, Oregon. Um, this is a beautiful postcard from way back in the day. All right, so the history. It all began in 1804 when Lewis and Clark scouted and mapped the Oregon County after leaving St. Louis. They um, developed great interest after leaving glowing reports of the mild climate, the lush green forests and fertile farming land, as well as the abundance of rivers and streams. And then in 1843, William Overton and Asa Lovejoy were floating down the Williamette River right along the Portland area and they came across Portland themselves. Pettigrove and Lovejoy had a coin flip actually to determine the name and obviously Portland won, Pettigrove won the coin flip. And in 1850, about 800 residents called Portland home. And then in 1859, Oregon actually became the 33rd state of the union. And these are a couple pictures from back in the day. And so the location and geography, um, Portland's actually located 110 miles off the Pacific Ocean coast. And it's between two mountain ranges, the Cascade Range and the um, Lower Coast Range. And along the Williamette River as well, which is one of the most fertile river valleys in all of America. Portland is the largest city in Oregon and it's the key industrial and commercial center of all of the Pacific region of the United States. So they get a lot of exports and imports in. And the city can be found in the very northwestern corner of the state of Oregon, and it's only one of the three states along the Pacific coast, so that includes Washington and California. And this heavily forested city contains more than 14 square miles of port, a park land, and it includes a 5,000 acre forest on the northwest side. And I included the latitude and longitude. And these are a couple pictures of different views you would see along Portland. There's a lot of city, but there's also a lot of beautiful landscapes to enjoy as well. And the best time to travel in Portland um, is from June to August. So during the summer months, the weather allows for a lot of the city outdoorsy culture to thrive. The temperature ranges from 50 to 80s and all the gardens and beautiful flowers are in full bloom. This is the peak tourist season, so it can get a little more pricey and you'll see a lot more people around the town than you would during the off months. If you're looking for a less crowded time to go or a cheaper time to go, I would plan around the winter months. And Mount Hood is also a great destination for the winter. You get a lot of snow and skiing. And anytime during the year, you can find something to do there. There's always a niche to be found. And the tourist and travelism I mean, the tourism and target market of Portland. So the target audience is a mix of adventurous, more curious people, because there's a lot of like adventurous stuff to do out there. They target adults, mostly 25 to 64, who have um, a decent amount of money to spend while traveling, because it can get a little pricey. And obviously I couldn't find much from 2020 with COVID going on. So I went back to 2019. The Portland region welcomed more than 8.8 .8 million overnight person trips. And the visitors to Portland metro area generated about 5.6 billion um, for the economy, which was great. And this eases the tax burden on local and state residents and allows for more travelers to come. The area travelers generated about 277.8 million in tax revenues. And this really boosts the travel industry out there, which 
Um, in 2019, they had 36,930 jobs just in the hospitality and travel field alone. And this generated 1.6 billion for the employment earnings. So a couple facts about Portland. It's the largest metropolitan area in all of Portland and it's populated with over uh, 2.4 million people. The state of Oregon has tax-free shopping, which is great, who wouldn't love that? Uh, Portland has more strip clubs per capita than any other city in the United States with one strip club for every 11,826 residents, which I thought was pretty funny. And every June, they have thousands of cyclists cruise around commando through Portland. Um, and it's a worldwide protest against oil dependency. And this all started in 2004. They weren't able to do it last year because of COVID, but hopefully they'll be able to keep on doing it in the future. And so this brings me to my specific details of my trip. So I planned my trip during the, um, the months that they said were the best, July 18th to the 24th. I did a seven day trip for two people and that time's during my birthday week. So I planned it as a birthday getaway. So for two people, it would cost about uh, $734 for a round trip flight. I did a one-way flight from Newark to Portland, Oregon. And once you arrive in Portland, the airport's pretty close to um, the hotels that I was looking at. So you'd only need um, a taxi or an Uber to get there. For the way to the Newark airport, I planned a shuttle and that was about $138 to get there. And then the best modes of transportation in Oregon include the TriMet, which runs buses, light rails, and commuter trains throughout the city. Services run about every 15 minutes every day, so you'll always have a way of getting around. And the fares starts really low at $2.50 for rides, or you can buy a $5 card for unlimited travel within 24 hours. Um, there's also the Portland streetcar. It operates three lines along 16 miles and it does a loop of the city. So if you want to get, want to like tour the whole city, that'd be a great option. Obviously Portland's going to have Ubers, taxis, and lifts. And walking is a great option as well because everything's pretty centrally located. And um, Oregon's actually one of the best places to go biking. They have 350 miles of bikeways and it's the nation's highest percentage of bike commuters for large cities and they're named one of the most bike friendly cities around. And you can actually borrow a bike while there with a $5 sign up fee and it only costs eight cents for every mile after that. So you don't have to bring your own bike. And then, so moving on to my accommodations, this was actually the hotel I went with. Um, it's a, an area with a bunch of little tiny houses. So when staying there, you get your own little house and it includes everything that a hotel would. It's a little bit smaller than your average hotel room, I'd say, but it's a different experience. And it's centrally located around all the um, places that I was looking to go. And these are a couple of the amenities and it had a 4.8 rating. So it was an exceptional rating. And for the stay, I was looking at the seven days, it was only $930, which was on the cheaper side out of all the places I was looking. You get your own queen bed and a double futon if you really wanna bring a couple more people to your little house. And then the next hotel, I was looking at the Marriott in downtown cause you can never go wrong at the Marriott. Had a really pretty view and it was um, located right in the heart of the city. So you can get to just about everything. You can walk, take an Uber. Um, again, here's what's nearby. You can see on the map, it's centrally located. This one was a little more costly at 1,062 but you get your own one suite bedroom and it had an excellent rating as well at 4.3 out of five stars. And then the last hotel I was looking at, this is the Pineapple Rose Hotel. So if you didn't know, the pineapple is actually the symbol of hospitality. So I thought this one was really cool. Uh, you have all the pretty vibrant colors and just looking at it on the inside, it looks like somewhere I would wanna stay. This one was a little more pricey um, it was 1500 for the seven days or six night stay, seven days, but this one was also centrally located and it had a 4.3 out of five star rating. Um, and this one, you get a balcony with your view. So that's great. And then moving on to some of the things you can do. So I chose the Portland International Rose Test Garden. 
It was established in 1917 and they have more than 8,000 species of different flowers and roses. And it's actually illegal to pick any of the flowers, which I think is great because you know people would be going crazy doing that. <laughs> And it's free daily admission. Um, donations are welcome to help keep the park thriving and it's open from sunrise to sunset. Then right below that, you'll see Powell's Bookstore. They are by far the largest bookstore in Portland and they claim to be the largest independent bookstore in the nation. They're actually, they compete with Amazon, which I think is great. Someone's got to challenge them. And in the top right, we have the Oregon Museum of Science and Industry. Admission for that is $11 for adults, $9 for seniors and children, and then $2 parking. Get to see a bunch of different sciencey things, which I think is fun. And then at the bottom, we have the Portland Art Museum. It's the seventh oldest museum in the whole country and the oldest art museum on the West Coast. I love a good art museum, so I included that. Admission's pretty cheap. You got $12 for adults, $9 for seniors, and kids are free. And then this shows how everything is pretty much centrally located in the middle of Portland, all the, and it included a couple other places to go, the top 10 things to do in Portland. And if you're looking for something more to do in nature, I included Mount Hood, which is one of the most popular mountains to go to, and it's only $5 per carload of people. And also I included at the bottom the 5,200 5, acre Portland Forest Park. It's one of the largest urban forests in the United States. As you can see, it's huge, has a lot of wildlife and it's located along the Williamette River. Also located right next to the zoo. So you could do a double trip out of that. And that's a picture up top of the actual forest park, real pretty. So food and beverages. This is one of the most popular places in all of Oregon, I'd have to say, the Voodoo Donuts. Um, I they have a couple different shops around town, but I included the Old Town location. And the donuts start out at 95 cents, which I feel like you can't beat. And I included some of their top favorites at the bottom. I think the strawberry Pop-Tart one looks really good. It's kind of like a Broad Street donut if you've ever been out there around here. And for the next location, I did Hoover's. It was um, established in 1879. It's the oldest restaurant in all of Portland. It's a little more kind of like fine dining. If you visited us in the 1890s, they say you'll still see patrons conversing with drinks in one hand and their famous turkey sandwich in the other. And it has a hundred years later, they're still known for the same turkey sandwich. I included some of their um, specialties of house. You can see it's not too, too expensive there. Some of their top prices, their most expensive thing on the menu was $45 for a filet. And then their drinks weren't too bad. It was $360 for a Remy Martin, <laughs> which you can expect for that. And it also had a 4.5 rating out of five stars and a couple pictures of the outside, the inside. It's still the same as it was back in the day. And for my final food location, I chose Matt's Barbecue. Can't go wrong with some good barbecue. They had a 4.8 rating and they're known as the best Texas barbecue in Portland. They started out as a small food truck, which you can see down in the right, but now they're working on getting their own actual like building. And this was a couple of their items that they had. When I took screenshots of their menu, everything was out of stock by the end of the day. So I think that just goes to show how good they really are. And so this brings me to current issues with traveling in Portland. So they have high crime rates in certain areas and neighborhoods, Portland neighborhoods, Hazelwood, Lentz, Powell's, et cetera, top the rank, most dangerous neighborhoods due to their high crime rates, fires, and the fact that they're home to some of the city's deadliest intersections. Um, ooh, what happened? There's still riots and protests going on. Um, the riots and protests ensued in 2020 over the murder of George Floyd and against police brutality. Today, the protests are still ongoing, making it so much, somewhat dangerous if you find yourself in the middle of one. And of course, the COVID-19 pandemic and the risk of traveling. And this brings me to my um, pricing for everything. So I priced it out. I did a couple of guesstimations on like the shopping expenses and food. But in total, it wasn't that bad for a seven day trip. It came out to about a little under four grand. 
which I think is pretty good for a week getaway. And then my work cited page. And that's the end. Great job. Give Thank Samantha you. a hand, um, please. That was so exciting. Um, does anybody have any questions for Samantha? Samantha, what made you choose Portland? I don't know, maybe um, I just missed it. <laughs> no, you're fine. I grew up in Arizona, so it was pretty close to us and I've always wanted to go, but never had the opportunity to. So I'm hoping within the next year, I can make a trip down there. That was beautiful. She did a great job. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. Yes, excellent job. Um, next up, we have uh, Randy Nauf, is did I say it correctly? Knauf. Knauf. All right. And Randy is also uh, Professor uh, Zupi's uh, uh, student. So uh, here's Michelle introducing her. Okay. So Randy is also a hospitality management major. And her project today is from our catering and event planning class. Uh, Randy planned a wedding reception for 100 people, which included the venue, the timeline, the menu for a cocktail hour, dinner, dessert, all the decor, transportation, entertainment, a timeline, and the cost. You could immediately see her theme and concept from her designs. So Randy plans on becoming an event planner. Um, she's continuing her education at Stockton for, for the fall. And I think this project and her future will be very successful if this project's any indicator. Okay. Randy, if you have a PowerPoint, you are welcome to share your screen. All right, perfect. Before I begin, oh, wait, I, I have to make you, oh, I have to make you co-host. My okay. bad. All right, try again. Okay, before I begin, I would like to say that I was very excited when I found out this assignment was being this project was being assigned because knowing I was wanting to get into this field, I thought I was going to get a perfect opportunity to see if I was going to enjoy this and how I would be like if I was if it was meant for me. So this turned out to be so much fun working on it. And oh, it says I had to let someone in the waiting room. Oh, okay. And it turned out to be uh, confirmed that I will enjoy this. So let me share. I'm going to take care. I made you co-host and I'm going to take care of allowing people um, into the room. So don't okay. worry. About that. Okay. Okay. So this event takes on a rustic woodsy outdoor aesthetic with a dusty sage accent color, along with a uniform floral and decor uh, appeal. There will be 98 attendants along with the bride and groom. Now, first for the project, we had to explain all the details that go along with it, but I'm going to describe that all to you as I show you the pictures so you get a visual. So let's jump down to the timeline. Starting at 1230, we have wedding photos and the guests will arrive at three o'clock starting the ceremony at 330. Then the ceremony will end at four, cocktail hour at 410, and it will end at 510. Then the reception will begin at 5.30 with appetizers at 5.40, dinner at 6, and the first dance at 7, cake at 7.30, and we will end the night at 10.30. Now, every wedding begins with an invitation, and I felt this one really drew in the aesthetic that I had for this wedding with the greens and whites and gold. For our dusty sage theme color, which the bridesmaids and groom will be wearing. Starting with the bouquets, there will be five needed, one for the bride and four bridesmaids. They're made up of carnations, baby's breath, spiral eucalyptus and gumdrop eucalyptus. And for the bride only, we will need a keto roses. For the boutonniere, we need nine. For one groom, four groomsmen, two fathers and two grandfathers and one ring bearer. They are also made up of baby's breath, gumdrop eucalyptus leaves and a keto rose. 
Then for corsages, I like to have for the two mothers and two grandmothers, which are made up of carnations, baby's breath, gumdrop eucalyptus. And actually this picture is one of my own because I made this corsage and boutonniere for my prom, which I thought paired very well with this wedding too. For the ceremony, uh, you first see the white arbor that is draped with white flowered wisteria. And we have 10 rows of chairs that have five across. The end chairs are decorated with gumdrop eucalyptus and two carnations tied with brown twine. We have a white aisle runner. Jumping to the reception, you will see the personalized welcome sign on acrylic that stands on a standing floor easel. Then our cocktail menu. We have hors d'oeuvres that are, have butler service. We have lobster, lobster mac and cheese, spinach artichoke zucchini bites, jalapeno popper stuffed mushrooms. And for a vegan option, we have vegetable dumplings. Then we have fish taco bites and buffet tables. We have two of them on each side of the bar. One's gonna be mostly fruit and meats and then the other is gonna be all seafood. The one we have antibiotics, fruit medleys, and the other is gonna have shrimp cocktails and a crab dip. For the cocktail hour, we have, it's under a covered patio and it includes the bathroom facility, the powder room and the wedding party suites. We have a wood trolley cart that holds the specialty ready to go drinks. Then our tables, we have nine of them that have for centerpieces, we have tall glass vases with gumdrop eucalyptus branches and sets of three cylinder vases with white floating candles. As for our bar, there's a eucalyptus leaf garland draped in front and some white carnations in vases on the two ends. Then for our butler service hors d'oeuvres, they are served on a wood serving platter. And these are how our um, buffet tables will be set up. The layout of the cocktail hour, we have this is where the facility for the restrooms and the suites are with the bar and the buffet tables on each side and the nine tables, with the trolley cart, and then you're gonna walk to the reception. And first you will see the cards table, which holds a, oh, which is, it has a glass basket for the cards. Then we have the guest names cards that are placed within slits of a wooden bark log. And instead of a guest book, we have a wooden board that is personalized and we have a white paint marker so the guests can sign. Then for our, we have a wine wall and a photo booth. They are matching with the artificial plain Milan hedge fencing and some artificial roses. The wine wall has shelving to hold the glasses and the photo booth has a personalized name cut out. These are now gonna be on both sides of the DJ booth. You'll, you'll see further. The DJ booth is gonna have uh, a eucalyptus leaf garland draped in front and they're gonna play a mixed genre and non-explicit music. The bar is gonna, is gonna be an open bar and serve not only alcoholic beverages, but also non-alcoholic beverage. For our dinner menu, starting with appetizers, we have bread with herb dipping oil, a spring mix salad, and then for your main dish, you have the options of a Parmesan chicken, a Maryland style crab cakes, or for a vegan option, spaghetti squash. For dessert, we have our wedding cake and a chocolate pudding parfait, and then some caramel ice cream. The, uh, all these are gonna be having a, a an American service. Jumping to our tables, so we're gonna have a total of five, two that holds 20 guests and two that holds 24, and then one for the wedding party that holds 10. And then there's gonna be a glass roofing on top. For our table decor, it has white tablecloth, eucalyptus leaf mixed garland with uh, carnations placed within, and sets of three tier glass cylinder vase with long white candlesticks placed at every two chairs. So we're gonna need a total of 20. Then we have white silver utensils, oh, 
silver, silver utensils, a silver charger plate, a white dinner plate, and a white salad plate. Then we're gonna have a light beige napkin and we're gonna do a leaf fold that's gonna be held by a silver ring. Then we have our bride and groom chairs that are gonna be decorated with white fabric and bride and groom wood cutouts and eucalyptus leaves. For our party favors, they are wooden sliced tea light holders with dried flowers and a personalized name cutout. And then this is how our desserts are gonna be displayed. Moving on to the diagram of how the reception is gonna be laid out with the dance floor in the middle and the guest tables bordering it. And up front, we're gonna have the wedding party table across from the DJ booth. And that's between the photo booth and the wine wall. Up here, we have the bar and this is all under the clear roofing. Then we have a price breakdown that everything, including the ceremony, the rental fee, the open bar, the food and non-alcoholic beverages, the bartenders, the DJ, the photographers, the flowers, the party favors and labor fees comes to a total of 33,230 and per person price, it came to 11950. And that is it. Thank you, Randy. Great job. <laughs> the, the passion that you have to have to understand all of the variations that you have to pick from. Personally, I'm probably twice your age or more. And I just found out last week the difference between a Maryland style crab cake and a boardwalk style crab cake. So, you know, just to know all the stuff that is involved in planning a wedding, amazing. So thank you. That was thank a good you. presentation. Does anybody have any questions for Randy? Great job, Randy. Thank you. Um, <laughs> next up, oh. thank you. Um, does anybody have questions? We can wait for a second for questions. I, I have a question. Yes. Uh, I, I think this was a lovely presentation and you made this rustic place look so elegant and I really applaud you for doing such a great job. Um, I do have one question. Um, you mentioned, I think at the dinner plate, the service was American style. I think you said that. So I'm not sure what that is. I hate to, to say, sounds like an odd question. Uh, during the class of catering event planning, we learned all the different services. So there's butler, there's buffet and American. So that just means the food is prepared behind and brought out to the tables. Okay, so it's like a sit down type yeah. of service. Okay, okay, thank you. You're welcome. All right, thank you, Randy. Um, so on this link, next up, we have um, Jeanette Palotico. Please tell me if I'm mispronouncing your name. Um, and Maeve McGuire. Um, so uh, they're, uh, they are the president and vice president of the TIN Club, the Innovation Network. Um, and they're, um, advisors are uh, Deb Mira and Tom Berkey. They could not be here and they are heartbroken for not being able to be here to introduce them. And I have some words that they sent me to read to you um, to uh, tell you how amazing these kids are. Um, so Tom says, I think you will find that they are extraordinary and will need no introduction. This, this academic year, they have run the complex process of planning a garden, raising funds, including a fabulous February health series, and implementing the creation phase so phenomenally that the amazingly involved tasks always seemed effortless. We are extremely proud and awed by them and the team they created and led we will dearly miss Maeve as she graduates and moves on to St. Elizabeth's to complete her degree work. We are heartwarmed that we will have the privilege of working with uh, Jeanette as president for another year. So please uh, welcome, let's see, Maeve and Jeanette. 
So um, I don't know if uh, one of you plans on opening uh, or, or sharing uh, a PowerPoint. Uh, you are welcome to unmute yourselves and share your screen and whatever you need. Thank you. I'll share my screen. All right, Maeve, you're up. Um, hi, so I'm Maeve. I'm the president of the Innovation Network. Um, we so we've got a couple of like tenants of what we do as a club. Um, we're student run. Um, so each sem it, go, it depends on like the size of the project, but depending it's either each semester or year. Um, we select a project that we're gonna work on. Typically it's either problems that students have encountered in you know, the community that they think uh, needs a solution or just project ideas that students come up with. And um, we kind of turn them into community service based uh, and project based learning, um, uh, specifically interdisciplinary learning. So, um, everyone in our club is a different major and everyone brings something different into um, all of our projects. And additionally, we have students uh, working specifically on the garden uh, for service learning. So they're able to take um, both what they learn in class into the garden and what they learn in their work in the garden back into class. Um, the garden is a monarch way station meditation garden that pretty much means that it will be a certified monarch habitat um, and that meditation element has to do with promoting mental health on campus. Um, it's been a long term project we started discussing um, and planning kind of right before COVID hit so um, We'd started planning the garden and then it kind of just got put on hold with COVID. Um, and then during last summer, we started um, actually coming up with a project proposal, coming up with plans, trying to figure out where we could put it on campus. And um, all last semester was when we actually began to, uh, we got a location. It's going to be outside of the lower level of the Student Life Center. Um, and we started coming up with the plans for how to build it, uh, where we're, how we're going to get it certified as a way station, um, what uh, plants will be in the garden. And um, we decided to kind of have this be a multifaceted project with a couple of different goals. Um, so obviously it, there's the environmental aspect of it, um, being a way station, which is a stop along the migration pattern um, for monarch butterflies. So that ties in um, environmentalism. And then we also wanted to um, have the element of wellness. Um, we had a psychology professor sit in on one of our meetings um, a while back, and she mentioned that a lot of students were coming in in crisis. And we have been trying to brainstorm ways to kind of counteract that or give some help to students. And we realized we could bring that into the garden with a meditation. So we have both um, herbs in the garden uh, for the aromatics of it. And then also we're going to have a, like a sound element with uh, chimes and bells. Um, we've also run a wellness series. We had um, in February, we had a couple of fundraisers. There was a, um, a Buddhist monk who taught meditation. We had a Reiki master who did a sound healing meditation. Um, professor Bonagiora, uh, who's a professor at Brookdale, uh, taught an herbalism class. And then I taught a yoga class at the end. Um, and then kind of the last element of the garden is um, the education of the garden. So there's QR codes and stuff. And then through the next, um, through next year, there will be um, kind of a second development of the garden. So right now it's just the building. Next year, it's going to be incorporating it into uh, 
as you can see, different curriculums and parts of the college. Um, so here is, uh, you know, this is actually the location of the garden. We had been trying to look for different locations. Um, it's actually right next to uh, the statue of regret. Um, so we um, came up with uh, the plan to, uh, well, there was a series of project proposals um, and we kind of were, we were getting feedback from different uh, clubs, what they would want to incorporate, um, administration, what they would want from the garden and um, over a series of different proposals and just uh, brainstorming kind of sessions with different groups, we got to the point where we developed a plan that um, everyone uh, wanted to be involved with. Um, and then we um, had to develop a budget for the garden. This was more Jeanette <laughs> than I. Um, it's not, it's definitely not my forte, um, but we uh, had to come up with basically all parts of the garden. So there's um, the plants. Uh, we had to actually figure out what plants were needed for both um, the herbs that we're incorporating into the garden and the, um, and what is needed to have it certified as a monarch habitat. Um, we had to plan the layout of the garden. We're, it's a raised bed garden. So we had to design the garden, um, started, which started on pen and paper and kind of developed into um, a CAD uh, file. And um, we had to use that to determine how much uh, materials we needed. So wood and screws. And then we had to do <laughs> a bit of math to figure out how much soil would fill the garden. And then there's the um, meditation uh, elements that we have to factor in the cost for. And additionally, there's a um, fee for, the, um, for it to be a certified habitat. Um, so, this had the. This is a series of plants that are uh, needed in the garden to be certified. Um, we have had um, both the students in the club, well, Jeanette and I, and then also other students in the club have been doing a lot of research on why plants are needed specifically. So we've come up with a large part of the garden is going to be education. So we're going to have QR codes placed throughout the garden, which link back to some information about um, each plant. So part of that is that um, we want to kind of uh, be able to explain what the purpose of each plant is in the garden. Um, so monarch butterflies, for example, lay their eggs on milkweed. Um, and that's the only plant I think that they lay on, but they also need, we also, we can't just have a garden of milkweed for butter, for the butterflies. There needs to be um, nectar plants so that adult butterflies are able to feed, not just, you know, the young. Um, and then uh, another component of education in the garden is uh, going to be, um, uh, the herbs. So that's both for um, the medicinal element in terms of mental health with um, the aromatics of the herbs, but then also um, as, uh, you know, in cooking and culinary and then as, um, you know, as medicine, uh, we've had uh, Professor Bonagura coming into uh, our meetings to, you know, he kind of helps us discuss um, the medicinal aspects and he's, uh, his English class that he teaches, I think it's English 122. Um, he has a emphasis on uh, alternative and um, herbal medicine in his class. So his students have come in to do service learning in the garden. I don't know where our slideshow went. Sorry about that. Hold on a moment. Pilot error, I'm sure. Okay. So um, the next few slides that we had, that was actually Maeve's portion. I just have a very few more to share. Can you guys still see my screen? Great. 
So as Maeve mentioned, one of the things that we had to do had to do was we had a fundraise for the garden. So I see Professor Hughes is on online. So shout out, we did a couple of fundraisers. Um, one, which was actually the first was um, sort of partnering with her company and offering, um, you know, sustainable clothing to raise funds. Um, I know Maeve talked about the virtual wellness series, which again, incorporated lots of different and interesting folks. And then we sort of did a, an adopt a plant, save a butterfly, sponsor a chime, so we could start to, um, you know, build funds in to account for the elements that were going to be part of the garden. So one of the things that was interesting about this project was how it evolved. I probably should have put Maeve's original draft in here because it was sort of a pen uh, and, and paper sort of square drawing. And this is sort of when it started to percolate in my mind that the different disciplines and curriculums at Brookdale really would be helpful in not only planning the garden, but sort of implementing it. For example, how much soil goes into these different size boxes? I mean, you know, I was in the middle of a math class, so it ironically worked out. But you can see it's not as easy as just putting a bunch of wood together, screwing it together, and filling the boxes. It's, it was really sort of a complex planning effort. And we were so fortunate that we had wonderful volunteers that not only helped us with the building, but the configuration. And you can see sort of on the left, we had um, we had an, indiv an individual who um, has a relationship with a member of our of our club, and she really put together this gorgeous diagram. So it looks like a bunch of circles now, but you'll see that there's lots of plants in here that are that are the the host plant, the nectar plants, the herbs are all included in this design. So when we talk about volunteers, one of the things, if not other than pulling this off, that surprised me and I the most was how successful we were in engaging volunteers. Um, we have students that are listed here. You can't see their faces um, because their heads are off and down and their masks are on. But in this case, it took us one hour to build one of the boxes. And then the other, I think it was 15 or 16 boxes we built in an hour. So it was pretty amazing that the entire project took about two and a half hours, um, again, with one hour to like sort of screw in one box. And the vast majority of the project was pulled together by our amazing volunteers. So here you can see them all. These are all um, mostly students from Professor Bonaguro's class or from Professor Mura's class. Um, so these individuals, um, um, that you see building the boxes um, are going to present, their responsibility is to present how, how this project uh, took place. And here you can see it's coming together a little bit more. You can see Professor Mura there checking everything out. This is Isabel, she's another member of the club. Um, and here we are at night. It was really sort of lucky that um, ironically, we were able to get the entire um, thing built as we ran out of sunlight. So um, here's our little group and we finished on March 30th. These are our volunteers in the back. Um, we had another, another day to sort of secure the plants together. For those of you who don't, this is Kathleen. That's her head. This is another volunteer over here um, getting credit for Professor Bonaguro's class, which I can't say how amazing that was that the people came out and did work. That's pretty, um, pretty simple to do, I guess, from a certain perspective, once you learn how to do it. And then they're able to get college credit. So that was great. That was April 2nd. Here's our soil delivery. Um, I know that sort of looks like a small mountain, but I can say that for the most part, Tylenol was a food group for a few days after we put all that in the boxes. And here they are, all of our boxes filled with soil. We used uh, mushroom compo uh, compost and soil. So, um, you know, that is to assure the success of our planting. And here's our little group again, again, all masked up. I'm not really sure what any of these people look like from the nose down, but here they are. Everyone here is getting credit for a class. Um, and then environmentality. 
So this is a super important part of where we're going next with the, um, with the garden. So as I mentioned, one of the things that Maeve and I cooked up with Professor Berkey was how can we fit this garden into every curriculum? And I have to tell you, it was sort of easy with math and with chemistry and even culinary arts from that perspective. It gets a little more tricky as you start to think about nursing, paralegal studies and automotive, but we really did find a way that students can get service hours in this garden based on every curriculum at Brookdale. Environmentality is really the repository of all of the information about the garden. So there are lots of different pieces in the garden. There's how we built it. There's, um, there's uh, the different types of plants. There is the herbology. You know, why would you, you know, why is inconation important? What are the benefits of lavender? Can you cook with lavender? There are people that were instrumental in building the garden. Um, so all of that is going to be housed in what is our current blog um, space called environmentality. And the thing that's important to remember for the 2021-2022 school year is that while environmentality are, and the garden this year was very much oriented toward building, next year it's going to be oriented toward computer science. So we are going to be looking for students to take this sort of, you know, wood, soil, grass, outdoor experience and turned it into a technological experience also. So with that, that is it for the Innovation Network. Does anyone have any questions? That was so impressive. Amazing job. Good job. Um, I want to be involved with this. I love uh, my garden and I'm trying for a butterfly garden. So um, I would like to help if I can. Does anybody have questions? Uh, I want to make a comment. My name is Catherine Edward, and uh, I don't want to say, but Tom Berkey and I sort of came up with the idea of tin many years ago, and this is really exciting to see how far it's come. I want to ask, what was the most difficult thing to do as a group? Turn yourself into a team, do the fundraising, you tell us what your thoughts are. What was the most difficult thing to do? I'll give my opinion just because it came to me so quickly. Um, being a team with Maeve and the club was cake, cake. I couldn't, I could, can't say how much I've enjoyed this experience. The absolute hardest thing for me was screwing the boards together. You would think that screwing 90 degree angle boards together would be easy. It's not. So that was the most difficult part, ironically. But luckily, there were students to help. Maeve? That's great. Um, that was definitely up there. I think one of the other things was having to reach out to find experts in like, you know, different parts of the college or like reach out to other groups for especially because Jeanette and I came into this as Oh yeah, we're gonna do, we're gonna design a garden, and so you know we we were I drew it on paper, and I was like I don't know this could maybe work. So you know we had to really um, ask for a lot of help, especially with that with um, the plants. So um, kind of balancing you know like what we know versus you know what we need to reach out for. That was. Um, I don't, not so much difficult, just kind of like different because this is, you know, TIN is a very interdisciplinary kind of club and experience. So working with, um, that was also my favorite, one of my favorite parts, working with so many different people. Well, that's really great to hear. Thank you so much for sharing this today. And I look forward to coming on campus when those plants are all grown and the butterflies get to have their repose here as they fly all the way to Mexico, which is an amazing thing when you think about the life cycle of these um, animals, or so I should say I, insects. I <laughs> do have a say. question. Um, I'm sorry, I do have a question. What do you need help with in the future? And since it's a garden at Brookdale and it's open to community to come and visit, if any, if, if any people from the community, if anybody from the community would like to help, what can we do to help? Do you need funds? 
Do you need volunteers? What would you like to have to keep this going? Um, so we are looking for volunteers, especially through the summer. We need people to help maintain the garden. Um, you know, we have our group, we have some service learning students, but the more people that are willing to help us maintain the garden, I think the better it will go because then everyone's not having to be there for hours and hours uh, every week. Um, so that's a big one. We are looking for um, some funds for the next phase of our projects. You know, we're going towards a technological side, which is going to be um, more expensive, I think, than the even the building of it was. Um, so we are we're looking for volunteers. We're looking for funds. We're you know, it's everything. <laughs> I did just want to say um, from the employee perspective, Jeanette, I'm sorry, did you want to say something to that? No, go ahead. You go first. I, I know that Debbie and Tom were not able to be here today, but my department has watched Tin and Maeve and Jeanette take this project from the very beginning stages to what it is now and beyond. And I just want to give our kudos from the college to you, um, to Tin, to Maeve and Jeanette for your dedication. It's impeccable and insurmountable and you guys should be super proud of yourselves. We are. Thank you so much. And that's actually what I was going to add is that we will definitely be communicating with everyone as to what we need moving forward. So we're grateful for the opportunity to present today. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, so next up, if you would like to join another presentation, uh, Nora Roberts, who is actually one of the outstanding students from STEM this year, um, is finishing up her presentation. Um, and then Julio Santiago Reyes is going to do his presentation next. So we have two more presentations going on the uh, NASA Fellows link. But thank you, all the presenters, very much. And I hope to see you there.